Join us as we track the development of children from birth to the school gate. The journey from naught to five. With a vivid imagination and able to play with other children in complex pretend games, this is the stage of the fabulous fours. Full of confidence are Robert and Elisa, both recently turned four. Kerry is keen to meet our two families and share her knowledge of this age. Four-year-olds are energetic, so expect lots of outings to allow them to run and skip, jump, hop and swim. They can spend ages on something they enjoy, and they're big on testing boundaries. This is a time to appreciate them and their developing awareness. I love everyone in the whole world. Do you? Yeah. Oh, wow. This is Manuela, who's Romanian and works full-time as an international payment specialist. And Chuba, a builder, who's Hungarian-Romanian. They emigrated to New Zealand three years ago. Almost one-year-old David and fabulous four-year-old Robert, whose parents are concerned about his jealousy of David. We can't do anything with uh, David, even hold him for a while or talk with him or sometimes even if he noticed that we look at David or we are interested in what David is doing, he, he just tries to, um, to move our attention towards him. At the moment, there's not much upside for Robert in having this baby. The baby takes a lot of your time and attention and yet isn't actually big enough to play with. Not much fun for him. So as David becomes bigger, he will become more of a playmate and he'll become more fun for Robert and that will be a bit of a bonus. He's communicating fairly clearly to you what he wants and in a way, the more that you can kind of follow his guide on that, the better. So the strategies that I would recommend are to really minimise your displays of attention for David when Robert is around. Pay David tonnes of attention when Robert isn't around. Also, when you are paying the baby attention, tell the baby stories about his cool big brother. So as you're changing his nappy or feeding him, say, you are so lucky, you've got this fabulous big brother. Do you know Robert can jump so high and he can run so fast and he can play with his beautiful train set? Yeah. Look what Robert did. And Robert will love overhearing that and it will set up a really nice thing where David looks up to Robert, which is what you want. He's so good with his trains. Afternoon tea. Manuela is also worried about her own lack of control, made worse by having no extended family around for support. Being under pressure, like probably every woman, with raising kids, going to work, taking care of the house, you know, um, I do get angry very easily and sometimes just for no reason. And sometimes I think, oh, it's just hormones or... Mm -hmm. <laughs> but um, I am concerned that I do get angry and it's him who... who and also David. Mm -hmm. I found myself screaming a lot and... Um, mm -hmm. That's a really loud signal that you need some, some things for you in your life that are lovely for you, that feed you and fill you up with, with good things for you. If you feel like you're losing control, put some separation between you and the children, but don't leave them unsupervised. In the first instance, you could lie down or put on some favorite music. Call a friend or change the scenery, take the children out for a walk. And then there are helplines and counselling services. What I'm going to suggest is a whole lot of, of kind of loving stuff yeah. that will make him more robust and make you more robust so that everybody can cheer up and, and kind of settle down together. Feelings and families just go around, <laughs> don't they? So if you're feeling angry and you be angry to Robert, Robert will then be angry to David. Mm -hmm. And then you'll be angry again at Robert because of that, and it just goes, it just bounces around. Children are basically motivated by one of three things. Control, friendship, or achievement. And at the moment, let's assume that Robert is motivated by control. <laughs> How I cut that down, Mum? You, you said you don't want me to cut it. 
how I how I eat it like that? No, I should cut it right. So children who are motivated by control share four characteristics in common. Firstly, they hunger for control and they will do almost anything to gain or regain control. Secondly, they notice the reactions that they cause in other people. They can make you angry or make you distressed or make you frustrated or... They notice that and they quite enjoy it. No. <laughs> Thirdly, they're kind of blind to their own role in the trouble that goes on around them. So, so even though they've kind of been causing all this stuff, they actually feel like they are innocent victims. And the final thing is that they can tolerate a vast amount of negativity, way more than the adults can tolerate. Why is he crying? So the important thing to remember is that children who are after control feed on anger. Please come back. You should never respond to, to kids like this with anger. Using time out is one of the most loving and fair ways of dealing with children's inappropriate behaviour. But Robert is adept at avoiding it. He has this thing of asking for hugs. Before me trying to, to tell him, it's like, it's like, oh, I knew I did something wrong. I want a hug. It doesn't give me the chance to, to do my part, mm. my role. <laughs> Parent trying to mm. tell so him. So some of that is him wanting control. So he would like to get away with doing the bad thing and go immediately to making up. If you write out the rules of time out and put them somewhere and explain them to him, and both of you s explain to him how it's going to work and it's not negotiable, he will get it. He needs to learn that with time out it isn't negotiable, but to get released he needs to say what he did wrong and say that he understands that that, that, that was wrong and apologise to you for doing it, and then he can have a hug. It's really important when you release children from time out, when they've apologised, that you don't hold a grudge. So you've got four minutes to forgive him, OK? So while he's having time out, you give yourself time out and do something nice for you and get your head prepared for giving him a really lovely hug. That's what he wants, and that'll be very reinforcing for him. So that's your job while he's having time out, is to get to the place of loving him again. Manuela speaks Romanian to Robert, Chaba Hungarian. But Robert always answers in English, which upsets Manuela. I was thinking about it and wondering whether some of that might be that he, he maybe gets told off quite a lot in Romanian. Oh, yes, he does. <laughs> <laughs> which would maybe put him off a little bit, I would think. You know, and so if you increased the positive things you said to him in Romanian, you know, about how neat he is, that might induce him to speak more. I was thinking that really with kids like Robert, you really want to increase the positive things you say to him. And you want a ratio of about 10 positive acknowledgements to one corrective or critical comment. And there are particular kind of comments that he needs. What he most needs are acknowledgements, not praising. So if you can just notice exactly what he's doing and comment on it as much as possible, that will really help that and he'll stop focusing on what he's causing in you guys and start focusing on himself. I see you're playing with your cars. Because <laughs> he needs to learn about himself. He's kind of an expert at causing things in you, but he's not much of an expert in himself. Sometimes I do feel that we, we might be an kind of old-fashioned parents, which don't feel that they need to talk with them. They, the kids just have to listen to us. It's so neat to listen to kids, because they say such really neat, interesting things. <laughs> yeah, and also to, to respect their feelings mm. and to treat them like a serious stuff, not like, a, oh, it's a, a child thing and uh, I'm the parent, he just, he should shut up now because it's nonsense what he's doing. It doesn't work like this, doesn't it? No. Meet our second family. This is Kevin, who runs his own business and community development with his wife, Christine. Jack is almost seven. And this is Elisa, who is a truly fabulous four-year-old. Well, Elisa's a, a very loving and affectionate little girl. Um, she's also, which is quite extraordinary, I think, very uh, well organised. Very particular, isn't mm, she? Very. Dear. 
she likes things done her way and, and if that does get disrupted that can make her a little frustrated. Mm. There's three main groups of children's temperaments. There's the easy kids like your Jack. So those kids have got a very tolerant to change kind of temperament. Then the next category is the difficult kids. They get grumpy a lot, they're kind of much more negative children and they have unusual body habits so they don't have regular sleeping and eating time so they're much harder to parent. And the category that I think Elisa is in is the slow to warm up category. So those kids don't like change particularly, change stresses them. It's the things that parents need to do if you have those kinds of kids is to anticipate change for them, talk them through things, rehearse the change that's going to happen. If there has been a meltdown because the change was too much, talk about it after the event and talk about what you could have done differently. Okay, okay that's good to know. Mm. Since turning four, Elisa has become a bit stubborn about following instructions. The thing that I really like as penalties, is something that kids hate and is quite good for parents, is, oh good, you've just shown me that you need more practice at that. So you want to pick a time that's really inconvenient for the child, but mm. convenient for you, mm and you make her practice. So tonight we're going to have 10 minutes practicing obeying me. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. Does it work on other adults? <laughs> yes. You never take things from me. Like a lot of siblings, Elisa and Jack fight. No! No! I heard that I got it. The less parents get involved, the better. When parents get involved in intervening a lot, what that tends to do is prolong the hassles mm. and because kids want your attention, they will get you in more and more and more, so you get kind of hooked into that. What works really well is to say to kids, you guys, I trust you to be able to come up with a good solution about this, and if you can't, I will. And you won't like my solution. So you say in this really <laughs> serious, I mean business mm. kind of voice, so they know mm. there's no fun going on. See? It looks like a head. That's a baby head. I need a big head. Or well, you could use that head for there, and I, you could, I could, we could put that one as the, for the baby's head. If they can't solve it, a good penalty for fighting is to make them do a shared activity that you need done. So tidying up a room or tidying mm. up some space or doing something because they will hate you. Mm. And we can handle not being liked, you know, mm. especially when we're getting something cleaned up and we see that it's <laughs> building their relationship. Mm. So that seems a good strategy. Mm. It's great that you could work out um, who was going to have the bits of Lego. Mm. Well done. The next stage of fighting is when children physically hurt each other. Injuring your sibling is really, really, really bad manners. And, and so as a family you could come up with a solution and put it with your rules, mm. that the, the consequence for doing right. that will be fairly severe. They might mm. have to apologise and make restitution. So do okay. something really good for the child who was oh, okay. injured is quite a good thing to do. Here's the bus. By four, children can start learning to take responsibility for their own things. When they've picked up the children when they come home from kindy and school, is they're responsible for taking their lunchbox out of their bag and emptying into the food rubbish or to the general mm. rubbish. Yuck! I don't want to look at there. And to putting their bag away and their things mm. away. And so she's actually really got into that routine now if she knows where everything goes. Elisa is not a fussy eater. However, she only likes to sample things. A couple of bites of fruit, and then she's ready to try something else. It's a bit tart, that one, is it? We are quite firm mm. about that she needs to eat dinner or lunch, not, um, you know, move on to something else. And um, it's a lot of negotiation about, you know, well, three more spoonfuls of vegetables and then, then you can be finished. A rule of thumb for children's mm. eating is to eat portions that are only as big as her tiny fist. Mm. If you trust their own appetite and go mm. with their own appetite, it will equalise and mm. work out to be the right amount for them, but it can be a bit distressing for mm. adults thinking, oh my God, she's eaten you know, a quarter of a carrot and mm. <clears throat> a few peas. <laughs> but yeah. over several meals, and mm. if you actually wrote it down, she will be getting everything that she needs. Yeah. Elisa is healthy and happy, and gives her parents a lot of pleasure. She's just so cute. She's just like oh. a puppy. 
<laughs> full of energy and yeah. completely innocent in the way that she relates with people and with us. And, and so loving. You know, she'll come up to you and she'll say, oh, I love you, Mummy, and, and, you know, I want to be with you. And I just, yeah, it's really sweet, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. I've said that we could always have a four-year-old in the house. <laughs> <laughs> Here's a cool idea to develop your child's balance. Empty out two golden syrup tins and fasten some rope through them. Tie it off at the height where James' hands are when he's standing on the tins. Oh, good boy. And he's off. This is a safer version of stilts and is a great way to achieve good coordination. For variation, ask your child to step backwards, sideways, and over things. And over the dinosaur. That's it, good boy. Gee, how are you going to crash your little leg? Watch out! Hours of fun. Good boy. If you want me to behave well, you need to be a good role model. If you shout, then I feel like shouting too. movement, making the connection between movement and learning to develop the whole child. Well, let's talk about why four-year-old boys in particular are really active. A hormone's released called testosterone, as you probably know, and testosterone makes a little boy incredibly active and need to run around and burn off a whole lot of energy. Little boys like to be almost competitive, uh, so they like to be doing everything fast and be there first. That's okay, we just have to know how to deal with that and how to build it into their active lives. And the other thing is that little boys' vestibular systems, which is your balance system, aren't usually as well developed at this age as perhaps little girls are. Little girls tend to do things like handstands, forward rolls and cartwheels, things that involve being upside down, and spinning. Whereas little guys tend to roar around and kick balls and, and all that kind of thing, which means they don't get that vestibular development. So maybe in, in Robert's play, it would be really cool if you could get him to do some rolling down hills. Oh. You know, when you go to the park, put him on the merry-go-rounds and all that kind of stuff. And do um, something new for him. Yeah. You can incorporate exercises to develop the vestibular system into all sorts of activities. When you're reading him a story, um, how about, instead of him sitting up close to you, how about him having lying on the floor, so every time you turn the page, he rolls over. So he's actually doing something active while he's listening to the story. Good boy. And by not being able to see the pictures, Robert will have to use his imagination. What animal do you think she can see on the tracks? I tell you. What animal do you think it can be on, on, on the tracks? Um, hmm? a pig. A pig? <laughs> Just sending them outside to play is not terribly exciting. You need to actually go outside and play with him. Research tells us that children who have active parents are six times more likely to be active themselves. It's really great if you can actually stimulate some challenge for him. Can you run around this puddle and jump in this puddle? So you're giving him an instruction, uh, and he's got to follow the instruction, but he's also having a lot of fun doing it. Can you jump over this? talk about it with him. See if he can do it another way. And what that does is that actually helps him to problem solve. Saying something like, good, that's great, well done. That's kind of a shallow comment. Good boy. I did it all by myself. All by the yourself. important thing for you to say after that is, gee, I really loved the way you did that, Robert. You lifted your leg really high when you went over the top of that. That was fantastic. Good. You really lifted your leg very well. Very good boy, Robert. Are you keen for Robert to uh, start getting into some sport? Oh yes, definitely. He already goes to um, swimming lessons with his dad, but um, I would really like him to start uh, practicing uh, playing 
um, other sports. Often Kiwi kids are encouraged to get into sport too early. And how children develop is that they first of all develop what we call fundamental movement patterns. Now what they are are things like walking, running, jumping, throwing, kicking, catching, those kinds of skills. Once you've learned it, you practice it and practice and practice it. And then it becomes an automatic skill. When something's automatic, you can actually do it without thinking about it. And that's where we need all those skills to be before we can start playing sport. Because not only do you have to do that, you have to uh, listen to the referee and understand what's right and what's wrong, play cooperatively with other kids, which is really hard to do when you're trying to do skills at the same time, and understand what winning and losing is all about. And that's a really difficult concept to be able to teach a four-year-old or a five-year-old or even a six-year-old, you know? And it puts a lot of stress on children way too early. So developing all these skills to an automatic level is the most important message that I can give you, and how you do that is by practising it. Old-fashioned games are a fun way to do this. Let's do it again. Yeah. Always take every opportunity to use the language of direction. When you're going out to the mailbox, instead of just walking to the mailbox, how about walking sideways to the mailbox? Or can we walk backwards up the hill? That's how you grow children's language, by allowing them to experience it while they're doing it. Run, run, around the tree. Four-year-olds are active and they need to be stimulated and they need to have outside play, but they need an active parent as well. So they need you to be out there doing things, challenging them, uh, pushing them a little bit out of their comfort zones, but also keeping them safe at the same time. The problem solving effects and the, the self esteem is so important here and um, if he's active and having those kinds of experiences he's going to be a happy kid. Good boy! Good boy Robert! Good boy, bravo Lama. I love you. Next time we meet almost five year olds, all ready for school. <laughs>